Hi, I'm Charlie Huang from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Frederick Health Hospital. Today we're going to talk about how to manage a spontaneous coronary artery dissection uh, that presents as a STEMI. The patient is a previously healthy 60-year-old man uh, who presented to our ED with a severe chest pain after an evening uh, playing board games uh, with his friends. Uh, in the ED, he uh, did not look that great. Uh, he was hypotensive, uh, bradycardic. Uh, he looked lethargic, uh, diaphoretic, and pale. ECG showed uh, sinus bradycardia, and there were three millimeters of ST elevations in the inferior leads uh, with the reciprocal ST depressions uh, in the anterior leads. So on cath, the uh, LED and circumflex uh, uh, both uh, looked fine. Um, the RCA is shown here, and it did look a little strange. Um, there is a long segment of disease uh, from the proximal to mid-distal RCA. There is a focal uh, segment of uh, critical uh, subtotal occlusion, but notice that the RCA then suddenly reconstitutes itself uh, just distal to that. The distal RCA looks basically normal. So while it's a little bit unusual uh, for a 60-year-old man, um, this does have the look of SCAD. So what should we do now? Well, um, to decide what we should do for this patient, uh, it does help to understand a little bit about how SCAD forms uh, in the first place. There are many uh, hypotheses uh, for the mechanism of SCAD formation, but in general, it's thought that SCAD uh, comes from bleeding uh, in the wall of the artery uh, due to rupture of the vasovasorum, uh, which are the microvessels that supply uh, the muscular media of the arterial wall. A hematoma uh, then forms uh, in the arterial wall from the accumulation of uh, blood. As the uh, bleeding into the arterial wall continues, uh, the hematoma expands and can start to compress uh, the lumen. The uh, hematoma can eventually completely occlude the lumen, and as it continues to expand, uh, it can actually cause the intima to burst and tear, which um, will actually decompress the arterial wall and can sometimes cause flow to uh, temporarily improve. Uh, but now you have an actual dissection uh, from the torn intima. If the tear is big enough, the uh, dissection flap can itself obstruct the lumen. And blood uh, flowing around the dissection flap into the arterial wall can again, uh, can again enlarge and extend the false lumen uh, to potentially uh, reocclude uh, the true lumen. So uh, with the mechanism of SCAD formation in mind, the uh, classification of SCAD becomes clear. Uh, if the intramural hematoma uh, uh, remains contained in the arterial wall and does not extend along the length of the blood vessel, then you have a type 3 SCAD uh, that looks a heck of a lot like your usual uh, atherosclerotic plaque. If the intramural hematoma starts to extend uh, longitudinally, uh, then you progress to type 2 SCAD. Um, with both type 2 and type 3 SCAD, uh, if rather than or in addition to extending longitudinally, uh, the hematoma starts expanding radially into the lumen, uh, you can get a vessel occlusion. If the intramural hematoma expands to the point of causing an intimal tear, then you have type 1 SCAD. This results in the formation of a dissection flap, uh, which is that classic white line uh, that you can see angiographically and communication between the false lumen and the true lumen. In some cases, a small intimal tear can actually be helpful because it decompresses the intramural hematoma and can result in a restored flow in the true lumen. However, the opposite can happen as well. Uh, the flail flap itself, as we said earlier, can obstruct the true lumen. And in addition, a blood flow from the true lumen can enter the false lumen via the intimal tear, enlarge the tear, and further extend the false lumen and rapidly uh, precipitate a reocclusion. So our patient's lesion looks most like uh, type 2 SCAD, uh, with a long partial occlusion of the true lumen, but with no obvious intimal tear and dissection flap. So SCAD almost always uh, heals on its own, and revascularization is very challenging and fraught with risk. So for the vast majority of SCAD cases, management is conservative. Patients are generally hospitalized for a few days uh, for uh, monitoring and supportive care. The exception are unstable patients. Uh, if the patient has ongoing chest pain, an ischemic ECG, or is in cardiogenic shock, or has salvos of sustained VT or VF, 
or if the left main is involved, then more aggressive uh, revascularization therapy uh, should be uh, considered. And for more uh, for unstable patients, this includes PCI or cabbage and uh, mechanical uh, circulatory, uh, circulatory support if needed. And sometimes ECMO and even impella uh, could be required. There was a case study, uh, a small case series uh, in uh, published in CCI in January of 2021 that demonstrated the feasibility of using impella to support some of the sickest uh, SCAD patients. So what do I do now with uh, this uh, patient on the table? Well. I did not think that conservative therapy was an option for him. He, uh, he had ongoing chest pain, he had three millimeters of inferior SC elevations, and uh, he uh, did not look uh, great. Uh, I wasn't sure, actually, that he met the uh, strict criteria for cardiogenic shock, but he was hypotensive. And frankly, uh, given that he was a 60-year-old man, I actually wasn't 100% uh, convinced at that time that what he had was actually SCAD. So, I uh, decided to go ahead um, and with uh, PCI. So a uh, PCI for SCAD and for any dissection for that matter is very different from regular PCI. Uh, and it can turn south uh, very quickly. So I had to do this very carefully. So I chose a, a JR4 guide. The JR4 is my standard STEMI guide for RCAs, but it's well suited here because the engagement is usually not deep and is less likely to cause further damage to the vessel wall. You don't want to choose an AL guide or a guide that will uh, deeply uh, intubate the vessel. Uh, next, I chose a uh, BMW wire. Again, the BMW uh, is my standard STEMI wire, but it's also well suited here because the tip is uh, fairly uh, atraumatic. And remember, we have type 2 SCAD here. There is intramural hematoma, but not yet an intimal tear. We don't want our wire to poke a hole uh, into the bulging intima and convert this type 2 SCAD to a type 1 SCAD uh, with a true dissection and a false lumen. Uh, for my wire tip, I uh, used a very, very small band, not quite a, a CTO tip, but uh, maybe just a little bit bigger. Again, um, the lumen of the RCA here in the scattered segment is very small. A big tip will make it harder to get through and it will, will uh, increase the likelihood of engaging the side branches or even scratching uh, the, uh, the intima. Now, I, I trust the laws of physics and I am a firm believer uh, in using torque devices to give you better control of the wire. However, um, for this situation, I uh, use the, uh, the fast spin technique with just my fingertips without a torquer. The idea here is to keep the tip of the wire rotating very quickly so that any force applied to any spot on that bulging intima is only for an extremely brief period of time. And, and I thought that this would make the intima less likely to tear and cause a uh, true dissection. Additionally, fast spinning also um, uh, helps uh, to keep you out of side branches. Anyway, as you can see, the vessel actually were wired, uh, was wired uh, remarkably easily, and we got the wire down to the PDA, and uh, we, were, uh, uh, we were in uh, business. All right, so should we predilate? Well, normally I always try to prep the lesion as best as I can before stenting, but for SCAD and dissections in general, I do the opposite. Predilating uh, can cause the intramural hematoma to extend and propagate the dissection. So in SCAD, if I can get my stent to the right place without predilating, uh, I don't uh, predilate. As far as the stent, I choose very long stents, um, far longer than normal, and land it far down into healthy tissue. The uh, idea is that the stented segment in the healthy tissue will pin the dissection down and help prevent the intramural hematoma from propagating further as the stent is expanding uh, more upstream. I've actually seen some operators uh, preemptively place short stents in healthy tissue uh, before uh, stenting uh, the dissected segment uh, for this very reason. Okay, so here we are after placing three long stents. Uh, we seem to be in good shape already. Um, the RCA looks quite good. So at this point, um, should we, uh, we post-dilate? Well, post-dilating is something that I always recommend and nearly always do, but SCAD, again, is an exception. Uh, overly aggressive post dilation can also extend uh, the intramural hematoma, and I've, and I've seen it propagate uh, the dissection beyond the stented segment. So SCAD is the one situation where, where uh, I will tend to err on the side of a stent under expanding rather than over expanding. 
Um, appropriately, uh, appropriately sizing the stent actually is, is actually quite hard to do in SCAD because you can't always tell what the healthy uh, tissue diameter is angiographically. So I was always, uh, I will almost always reach for uh, intracoronary imaging, uh, but even that doesn't always help. So we did IVIS, and uh, here is part of the uh, IVIS run. Uh, this you can see pretty clearly that uh, we uh, that the stent is well sized and well opposed, and that we seem to be in healthy tissue. But as the IVIS pulls back, uh, you'll start seeing a dark echo-free area around the stent, initially on one side, and then eventually circumferentially all around the stent. Uh, this would normally look like a massively undersized uh, and underexpanded stent. For, for this patient, uh, it is probably the intramural hematoma from the SCAT that we're seeing. And honestly, it was uh, tough for me to tell within that segment whether my stent was well opposed or not. So, so what, uh, what can we do? Well, um, I reached uh, for the other intracoronary imaging modality, OCT. And, and here's the OCT run. Uh, you already saw that there is, in fact, a, a proximal uh, dissection flap, and this could have happened with the guide, but I suspect that it happened with the stent tearing the bulging intima as it was being deployed. But overall, the stent did appear to be well-sized and uh, well-opposed. Uh, it's a, a little harder to see the intramural hematoma here uh, compared to IVIS. Uh, you can make it out, but uh, it's, uh, it is a little bit uh, more uh, subtle. Uh, anyway, um, so based on the uh, OCT images, uh, I did not think I needed to post it any further, but I did need to stent uh, the uh, proximal edge um, of the vessel. So here is the uh, final angiographic result, which we thought was quite satisfactory. Um, the, the patient uh, did well. Uh, his troponin was only minimally elevated, and his EF uh, remained normal. Uh, we recommended imaging for FMD, uh, which uh, was negative, and he went home uh, a couple of days later. All right, so, so what about uh, medical therapy for acute SCAT? Um, there is unfortunately not a lot of clinical evidence to help guide medical therapy in SCAT patients. And much of the evidence is based on expert consensus and very limited studies. And even anticoagulation is controversial given the uh, potential risk of anticoagulation extending and worsening the bleeding that's causing uh, from the visovisorum that's causing the intramural hematoma. So it is thought to be reasonable uh, to uh, discontinue heparin once SCAD is diagnosed, unless there is clear uh, intraluminal thrombus. Um, aspirin up to one year is reasonable. Um, the benefit of adding a P2Y12 inhibitor is actually unclear. The, um, uh, a recent report from the DISCO registry uh, suggests that adding P2Y12 inhibitors may actually cause harm um, at one year. Uh, beta blockers, uh, which can help with blood pressure and heart rate control, uh, that start to reduce shear stress um, can be helpful. And the benefit of statin uh, is also unclear, and they are really only suggested for patients who have a pre-existing uh, need uh, for a statin. Um, if the patient uh, was unstable and underwent PCI or cabbage, then the usual guidelines for uh, dual antiplatelet therapy uh, apply. Um, um, there is a limited data for uh, post-SCAD uh, management as well. Uh, SCAD patients often will have additional vascular abnormalities, uh, classically fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD. So as with this patient, CTA or MRA is generally um, recommended. Um, overdoing physical activities such as exercising to exhaustion or extreme endurance training, elite sports or weight training uh, should be uh, avoided. Uh, but in general, it's thought that moderate exercise is likely overall um, beneficial. Uh, the uh, rate of recurrence is thought to be anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, but factors associated with recurrence are, are still really poorly understood. Uh, but it is thought to include FMD, uh, extreme exertion, or uh, emotional stress. All right, um, take-home messages. Um, we went over a possible mechanism for the formation of SCAD, uh, which starts with the uh, spontaneous rupture of blood vessels inside the arterial wall itself, uh, which then causes bleeding into the arterial wall and ex an expanding hematoma that uh, can eventually tear the intima. Uh, treatment for SCAD is uh, generally conservative, but not always. Um, as we saw in this case, uh, revascularization is sometimes needed for unstable patients, STEMI patients, but uh, do PCI carefully. Uh, stenting dissected vessels is not the same as stenting normal vessels. Use long stents and avoid uh, overexpansion. 
Uh, intravascular imaging can, in some cases, be very useful uh, to help optimize your stent, and OCT uh, can uh, provide especially clear uh, images. Thank you for watching.